Hello Internet! Welcome back! I'm Pastor Theo and this is part two of our special two-parter where we ask what religion is doing teaching anyone about human sexuality. I mean, come on, we're talking priests of the cloth. They've never had any such experience in their life, allegedly. In any case, if you haven't watched part one, you need to go do that right now. Right now, go! Because most of this isn't going to make any sense if you don't have the context for what we're talking about. And for the rest of you, I know it's been pretty controversial up to this part, but don't worry. It gets worse. You know, a lot of time and effort goes into the making of these episodes, so I hope you'll give us a like and support us on Patreon. And now that we're all on the same page again, let's get started where we left off. You know, the ancients had aversions to a lot of different things in their time. I mean, they had rules and policies for all kinds of things. Uh, there was only certain animals you could eat, only certain times of the year, and you had to handle the sacrifice in very particular ways, and inheritance was a big deal. And what else? Oh yeah, you couldn't go near women like three and a half weeks out of the month, give or take a day or two. I mean, I guess it kind of made sense for them in their time in the desert where there wasn't a lot of water resources and you couldn't just take a bath anytime you wanted to. So maybe there was a hygienic issue there that made sense. But really today, there's no reason to have any concern about it. Also, certain foods ran a greater risk of parasitic contamination and it's natural to have strict guidelines about inheritance to avoid infighting amongst family members. But we don't live in a tribal society anymore. We're able to cook our food completely. And we are more hygienic than we've ever been in any other time in human history. So the aversions to the normal healthy cycles of a woman's body shouldn't bother you. It really shouldn't be a big deal. Whoa, okay, whoa, put that down. You don't throw scriptures. You don't throw scriptures. Okay, we good? We calm? We good? Okay. Now listen, I'm not actually advocating for adultery. This is one of those scriptural dictates that line up with cultural, religious ideals and policies. But let's talk about it a little more anyway. All the major faiths have commandments that say, if you're married, you must be faithful to your spouse and never have sex with someone else's spouse. However, culturally, there are a lot of distortions to this seemingly straightforward command. The ancients in the Bible often got around this rule by having multiple wives and concubines. But no such luck for women who were subjected to the demands of her husband. Religious cultures all across Europe, the Middle East, dictators in Asia, and in America have all at one point or another instituted policies to get around this holy mandate to not commit adultery. Interestingly, today, one such policy stands out heavily in the Islamic culture. The tradition known as Siga is a practice of temporary marriage where a couple can get a certificate that allows the two to be legally married, but with an expiration date that can be for any length of time, with the payment of a dowry, of course. Essentially, is legalized prostitution without damaging your spiritual standing with God. Oh, and here's something interesting. Did you know that geneticists have discovered a gene linked to one's potential to cheat? According to an article in the New York Times, a 2010 study found that subjects who carried a variant of one dopamine receptor, the D4 receptor, were 50% more likely to report sexual infidelity. This D4 genetic variant has reduced binding for dopamine, which implies that these individuals walk around at baseline feeling less stimulated and hungrier for novelty than those lacking this genetic variant. The article also says sexual monogamy is distinctly unusual in nature. Humans are among the 3 to 5 percent of mammalian species that practice monogamy. But even in these species, infidelity has been commonly observed. Okay, so yeah, there's usually a lot of other factors involved in a person's extramarital activities, often emotional in nature. But regardless of why a person cheats, genetic and psychological factors are involved in both men and women. We are heavily influenced by external and internal factors. In some cases, those influences can overpower our judgment such as in the case of hormonal imbalances and even tumors that can put pressure on glands and parts of the brain that trigger mood and behavior. Now, of course, I'm not saying that cheating may sometimes be unavoidable or justified, but religious ideas about the behavior have never done anything to address the matter in a productive way. On the other hand, science and psychology have done wonders in understanding such activities and how we might better balance our impulses. 
so that we are less likely to hurt our partner by betrayal. There may even come a time that those who have this cheating gene might be able to go to the doctors and get a simple injection that will balance their hormonal levels and make them feel even more strongly for their spouse and less likely to cheat. Where religion is concerned, the decree to not commit adultery was clearly born out of alternative ideas from the values we hold for fidelity today. It largely goes back to the tribal traditions we spoke about earlier. The need to protect inheritance, family lines, and property and women were treated as property. We still use the Eighth Commandment today, but for very different reasons. And it's really okay that we're using it for our own cultural beliefs, but simply saying something is wrong and commanding that you shouldn't do it is usually never enough. If you're not also willing to help people understand the value of obedience and offer practical solutions to those who struggle with the command but want to do better, if we choose to uphold a command but fail to do these last steps, we find ourselves guilty of arbitrary condemnation of alternative societal groups, drawing a line in the sand that says, you aren't welcome here. This goes against the law of inclusion that Jesus emphasized and against his laws of judging others also. Okay, so there are at least a couple of scriptures in the Bible that are very specific about homosexual activity being against God's law, but while the Book of Mormon is silent on the subject, Mormons and Christians are pretty well against sexual acts between same-sex couples. The Quran is also nearly silent on the subject, but has suggestions that such activities should not be done, along with the Hidath, which are recorded works of Muhammad. These are more specific about condemning homosexual behavior. The Buddhists, however, don't seem to take any position on the subject beyond the edict of avoiding sexual misconduct that goes for all, which is largely interpreted as following the laws and customs of your people and not getting carried away with sexual desire, just as you would avoid desire of any kind. So those of you hoping I would find some way of refuting this one entirely, I'm sorry to disappoint. But don't go away just yet. We are absolutely still going to talk about this. The scriptures in question pretty much just say, don't lay with another man the way you lay with a woman. It is confusion. Okay then, but often the ideas surrounding how homosexual culture should be handled by religious groups are very misguided. This is another area of religious culture that isn't helping itself or anyone else and really makes religion look bad. The estimates of those identifying as homosexual or transgender are around 3 to 5 percent worldwide. But out of a world population of over 7 billion, that is a lot of people. If we assume the percentage is constant, the more our population increases, the number of individuals identifying as gay or transgender will rise in proportion. Estimates predict we will reach a world population density of around 10 billion by 2050. That means we could have as many as 400 million people that are being excluded from mainstream religious communities. Those are a lot of souls that religion is fine with just throwing away. And what is their justification for this sort of treatment? Well, a quick look at the Bible's description of God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah seems to be implicated. It's heavily suggested in the story contained in Genesis chapter 19 that the citizens were prepared to rape two men who had come into the city and were being protected by Lot. The sinful actions of the citizens of Sodom have always been overly simplified to refer to a homosexual act. But that is not in fact the sin that incurred the wrath of heaven. How do I know that, you ask? Well, because the Bible actually tells us exactly what the sin of Sodom was. In Ezekiel chapter 16, God says the sin of Sodom was that she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Now I know, I know, the book of Jude verse 7 also condemns these cities for sexual immorality and unnatural desires, but it's clear there was much more to it than just sexual misconduct alone. And remember, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament actually gives an example of sexual immorality as being with the father's wife. So it's not all about homosexuality. The stories many of us were told about the destruction of this and the other three cities located in the valley near the Dead Sea have been a lie, fabricated by misconstruing the details in order to place unwarranted emphasis on condemning individuals whose minds work a little differently than ours, and has never been deserved. 
Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they were the biggest jerks of the ancient world. They went out of their way to abuse visitors, they were hostile towards any outsiders, and carried themselves with pride and a superiority complex offensive even to God. The irony here is that those who have often gone out of their way to abuse members of the LGBT community today are probably guilty of this same sin that brought about the famed destruction of the past. Oh, here's a fun one for you. Yes, some groups have specific edicts about oral sex, or fellatio as it's sometimes called. While there doesn't seem to be anything about it in the Buddhist scriptures, the Buddhist culture has varied opinions on the issue. On the other hand, Islam has no specific dictates about oral sex practices, but I did read several articles that suggest Islamic followers would not generally partake in such an activity. They find it undesirable, and there's heavy suggestions that they think it's gross. Well, that's cool. More power to you guys. But what about the Christian and Mormon groups? The Bible has no guidelines about what a husband and wife can do with each other in the bedroom. Neither does the Book of Mormon have anything to say on the matter. Nor does any of the other three standard works of the LDS Mormon Church have anything to say on the matter. Yep, Mormons have four books of scripture, including the Bible. Yet, many Christians and Mormon groups have strong feelings on the matter. Where do these aversions and prohibitions of fellatio come from? Well, actually, the taboo largely stems from the story of Sodom that we talked about earlier. The name of the corrupted city became synonymous with sodomy. Sodomy is often thought of as homosexual sex or anal sex, but this is inaccurate. Sodomy, in its broad definition, refers to any sexual activity that is non-reproductive. Therefore, many religious groups who use the Bible have aversions towards oral sex because it is often grouped together with the practice of sodomy. But check this out, that's not even accurate either. The word sodomy comes from the Latin sodomiticum, meaning sin of Sodom. And what again was the sin of Sodom? Well, it wasn't homosexuality, nor is it any particular kind of sexual activity. A strong argument can be made for rape to be included with the sin of Sodom, but that is incidental to what we're talking about. The term sodomy used today is a modern invention based on prejudice, ignorance, homophobia, and does not represent the scriptural basis accurately in any degree. You know, maybe we should think about changing the definition. If we base our knowledge on what the sin of Sodom was strictly in the scriptures, a sodomite could then refer to anyone who is arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned, who does not help the poor and needy, or anyone who is haughty or does detestable things before God. So all those times you were told these sexual acts were somehow poison to the sanctity of your soul is a made-up invention of jealous and guilt-filled priests unable to deal with the emotional turmoil of forced celibacy. Crazy celibate knuckleheads. However, there is one additional edict related to oral sex that needs to be addressed before we can move on. Because you see, the Mormon Church takes things a little bit further than everyone else. For those of you unfamiliar, the Mormon Church, also called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, believes that their gospel is the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, that his truth was returned to mankind through heaven's guidance and revelation through a prophet called by God himself and priesthood authority returned. This means that for members of the Mormon faith, the president of the church is called by God, much like how the Catholics feel about the Pope. And this president is a prophet who talks to God, and what the prophet says is law. On January 5th, 1982, the first presidency of the Mormon church, including the prophet, issued a statement regarding issues of temple attendance and sexual relations between spouses. In one paragraph, it is stated, the first presidency has interpreted oral sex as constituting an unnatural, impure, or unholy practice. Now, for many members, they aren't even aware of this. And upon finding out right now, in this moment, because I just told you, they're freaking out because they've tried it and they didn't know any better and are about to get on the phone with their ward secretary to set up a confession appointment with their bishop. Whoa, whoa, come on guys, settle down, listen closely, put the phone down, breathe, because you've done nothing wrong. Heresy, you say? Well, there are two points of interest regarding this statement. The first being that the quote explicitly says that this is the first presidency's interpretation. All good LDS members know that the prophet has his own opinions and ideas, and these are not to be taken as scripture in any way. 
Only when the prophet is acting in a capacity as prophet for the church and invokes heaven's guidance as the source of any dictate is his word to be taken as scripture. This is echoed by President J. Reuben Clark who said, As to what the earlier brethren have said, where they have declared themselves as speaking under inspiration and by the authority of the Lord, I bow to what they say. But where they express views based on their own understanding and interpretations, then none of us are foreclosed from exercising our own reasoning powers, inadequate though they may be. But the earlier views do not foreclose us from thinking. This is particularly true where we come to interpreting their interpretations." End quote. So by stating that this view on oral sex is their interpretation, the First Presidency is admitting that this is not a view that has come from heaven. It's their own idea and should be taken as such. But we're not done here. The second issue I have with this statement is that it's imprecise. It refers to oral sex as unnatural, impure, or unholy practice, or unholy. What do you mean, or? What is it? It can be all three, or just one, or two, but it can't be one or another. Make up your mind. Additionally, this is oddly specific. Why single out a particular activity in this manner? I'm all for religious leaders being specific about what they preach, but in this case, you can't single out one specific sexual activity and just stop there. This opens up a Pandora's box of interpretations as to what other acts constitute an ambiguous definition of unnatural, impure, or unholy. I mean, what about anal? I really can't understand why, but I guess some people are into that. What about wife on top? Reverse cowgirl? Motorboating? Did you know the Catholics used to execute people who were found copulating in positions other than the missionary? Were they right? I don't know anymore because you made a seemingly arbitrary statement about a specific activity and remained ambiguous on all the rest. I really can't say I have experience with any of this, but now I wonder if I need to be worried about it. You know, there's a special place in hell uh, for some people, I'm, I'm sure. I don't have specifics. The point is, there is a term for this kind of lazy religious preaching. It's a term I invented, and no, the term is not lazy religious preaching. Although that pretty much sums it up. I call it passive sectarian exegesis. It happens whenever a religious authority makes a statement that is unsupported or incomplete, or just misinterprets a scriptural verse to reflect an inaccurate belief system, assuming, of course, that it is done unintentionally and not actively trying to preach false doctrine, which happens a lot. I think I've proven that by now. Isn't that why we're doing this in the first place? And we're only halfway through this mess. Oh, and if you were wondering how the Catholic Church was able to find out how people were doing it, they had religious police just randomly checking in on you. In conclusion, oral sex is just what you make of it. Taboos against it are fabrications from biased leaders and unsupported by heavenly influence. You know, some religious groups are very strict about intimate contact of any kind. Kissing is especially illicit in these groups because of the activity's strong sexual nature. Kissing creates a close intimate vulnerability and exchanges bodily fluids, much like sex does. Except theologians who follow this belief system are forgetting one very particular thing. Kissing is not sex. If that's too hard to understand, I'll remind you that Jesus kissed other people. Jesus kissed other men. Shocking. Onward. Okay, so I'm just going to come out and say it. The idea that viewing pornography destroys marriages is patently false. Many things lead to destroying a marriage, but the simple act of viewing anything is incapable of doing anything by itself. Marriages are destroyed by the hurting of a spouse, plain and simple. The question should be, can pornography's use cause harm to a spouse? Among overly sensitive, insecure members of a religious group, most likely yes especially if the membership is less educated on the subject of human sexuality. And they are. They just, all of them. I thought that's why we're doing this. Look, there is all kinds of information out there regarding the use of pornography in society, the industry itself that produces the content, and the effects it can have on long-term relationships. But actually, it's only been recently that we've been able to gather good data on the subject. Because up until recently, appropriate trial groups have not been able to be gathered to study the subject effectively. The internet isn't that old. 
High-speed internet has been available to everyone for even less time, and age groups have only recently become available to perform the appropriate studies. So actually, we don't know a lot, and we are still learning about the effects of pornography on our society. Yes, it's always been around, but it just has never been around in the quantity and availability it is today. What do we know so far? Yes, the porn industry exploits women and is rampant with disease and drugs and violence and is a hotspot for human trafficking. It is also a safe environment that enables men and women to make decent money that is very hard to come by elsewhere, especially for young students with no other ability to pay tuition or loans and, and can provide them with an environment of community support for medical treatment and funding for other projects. Yes, pornographic addiction is real and may cause issues in a person's work and social life. It can lead to depression or exasperate other mental health issues. It also may be a healthy outlet for adults young and old who experience a high sex drive but have no other way of exploring or dealing with those desires that, that can cause aggression, violence, stress, depression, anxiety, and restlessness. Yes, pornography creates a false reality of what sex is or should be and perpetuates false expectations about what men and women want from a committed relationship. But it also can act as education for those uneducated about sex life, how to express love effectively, lovingly, and in an effective manner to satisfy your partner, leading to stronger bonds of love and friendship and trust. It can even act as a stimulant for couples having trouble with their sex life. There is no definitive answer one way or another. If pornography is abused, it can cause harm to the relationship, like anything else. Probably in the same way alcohol abuse destroys relationships, or being a huge jerk. Psychology is still trying to figure this one out, but porn by itself is not what is destroying your marriage. If you think it is, you should think about what sort of relationship you actually have, because chances are there are other unhealthy behaviors going on that have nothing to do with that browsing history you discovered. Oh, but it is really bad for computers. I think that's a given. It'll crash your computer. Along with other religious groups that are all uppity about proper non-spirit degrading performances of sex, those that feel there is only one way, the right way to have sex, is the idea that sex is only for procreative purposes. Where did you get that from? Whoa! Ugh. Okay, okay, I'll level with you. Yes, it's important for us all to learn to bridle our passions, not get carried away, to not behave like animals, stop being so rapey, and don't abuse the procreative powers we've each been given. But in no way have the scriptures ever put this kind of restriction on sexual activity. It serves way more purposes than just perpetuating the species. Hey, it's great if you want to have kids. You raise that family. But nobody wants to be pregnant every year of their life. For one, that leads to a much shorter lifespan in most cases. But sex can improve individual lives in dramatic ways. It acts as a stress relief, it's a great source of exercise, helps clear the pores of your skin, releases healthy hormones that aid in a positive outlook on life and contribute to a healthy mental attitude. It facilitates bonding between couples, it lowers death rates and risk of some cancers, it increases your immunity to the cold and flu virus. It aids in better quality of sleep and is great exercise and is great exercise and great exercise. I know most of you don't get enough of that. On the other hand, many studies show how abstinence is actually harmful. Some religious groups are starting to understand this better today and are making changes to better the quality of their institutions. For example, Buddhist monks in Japan have for several generations been able to marry. The shrines they care for have been family businesses, passing down the job of caring for their temples to their children. It's become very positive for the communities. The Islamic prophet Muhammad has been described on several occasions as chastising his friends and other followers who were neglecting to take care of their wives' sexual needs. And today, the Catholic Church is likely going to make reforms soon that allow some priests to marry in order to encourage more men to enter the priesthood and serve in areas where there is need. Of course, this isn't all that new either. The Church for centuries has wrestled with trying to keep its priesthood celibate. Before 1200 AD, many of them weren't. You can't rob a child of innocence. They are the embodiment of innocence. When a child has been abused, heaven forbid, the child is still innocent. 
Innocence is only lost when these little half-people develop mentally to the point of independent understanding of their actions and are able to choose between right and wrong, knowing the difference. And by the way, I've known some adults who are barely capable of this. All you are doing by educating your children about sex is educating them. And don't not do that. If you don't, you may be worse than the religions we've been talking about. Because I think it's pretty obvious by now that religion is incapable of educating anyone on matters of human sexuality. But at least they tried. Well, I guess I jumped the gun a little bit on this one and already said that religion is incapable of educating anyone about sex. But I just feel it's that important to emphasize. I'm going to say it again. History has shown us that religion has created some pretty sketchy ideas about the nature of human sexuality and has had pretty much the opposite of any healthy ideas about it. The unbalanced amount of negativity about human sexuality has created a sore spot in the human consciousness that makes it difficult for lifelong members to express healthy relationship building intimate contact. The essential ingredient in promoting strong family bonds that create happy homes for children to grow up in and be sustained over a lifetime. But sure, let's take all of our advice about sex from supposedly celibate priests who have no experience on the subject. I'm sure nothing could go wrong with that idea. Actually, statistics show that among the heavily religious populations of the United States, such as the Bible Belt in the South and groupings amongst the Rocky Mountain regions, the rates of teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, pornography usage, and sexually related crimes are higher than other parts of the country with comparative populations. Good job, religion. Way to fight the good fight and convince those sinners to change their ways. But seriously, do these figures indicate that religion is having the opposite effect on its members? Well, if sex has stress-relieving effects and religion is overly negative about sex, triggering stress and depression in anyone with genitals or who is otherwise capable of becoming aroused, to the point that they need to find stress relief that in turn creates more stress and depression because of what they were taught in Sunday school, maybe we are creating a cycle of events that triggers more sexual dysfunction. Here's a thought. Maybe religion can start offering information that is actually helpful about sex. Information that is not rooted in ancient tribal law, prejudice, or attached to the idea that you're going to hell if you suddenly start having feelings for another human being when you're 12. Until religion actually educates its members about sex, the membership will continue to be ignorant on how to address the subject effectively, and sexual ignorance will continue to perpetuate the deviant behavior that drives our statistics. No, it isn't. You're uncomfortable with the topic, and that makes you the problem. And the sooner you get over that mess, the better off you and those you influence will be. Normalizing sex doesn't create more sexual deviancy. Instead, it takes the novelty out of it. Now, this is a topic that has specific religious significance to the LDS or Mormon faith. And as we talked about earlier, for the Mormon faith, the First Presidency's word is often taken as scripture, much like how the Pope's word is doctrine for the Catholic faith. In 1942, the First Presidency of the LDS Mormon faith made the statement, sexual sin stands in its enormity next to murder. This isn't the only time such a hard stance on human sexuality has been made. It's a popular expression and understanding of the church's policies, of the church's teachings, and has been perhaps for most of the church's lifespan to this very day. But where does this belief come from? Was it handed down from heaven like some divine revelation or inspired by the Holy Spirit whispering to the prophet after hours of meditation, prayer, and fasting? No, no it wasn't. Actually, it's all based on one of the three scriptures in the Book of Mormon that has anything to do with sex. Alma chapter 39. In this chapter, the prophet of the time, Alma, is having a long heart to heart with one of his sons, Corianton who was on a mission with his father and brothers teaching the word of God. But Corianton left his responsibilities and ran off with a woman. By doing so, Alma had problems teaching the people of the land because they wouldn't believe him after seeing what Corianton was doing. Now all my Mormon friends out there are right now nodding their heads going, yep, that's how it happened. And what I'm now going to tell you and them is that that story is far from anything resembling anything anyone has ever called accurate ever. 
Actually, what his father Alma explicitly states is that he boasted in his own strength and wisdom. He left the ministry, went over to another city after a harlot, Isabel, who did steal away the hearts of many. Now, in the scriptures, Bible and Book of Mormon, the word harlot is used for prostitute, but is also associated with the imagery of idol worship. And the heart is often used with imagery associated with testimony. Corianton went after a woman who, like so many other biblical protagonists, worshipped false gods and sought to corrupt the believers and kill their faith. Now isn't that much more telling in the storyline? When we remember that this account is supposed to take place when everyone is still following the law of Moses. Idol worship was a big deal. Arguably still is. We just don't call people on it anymore, saint worshippers. Now I'm not going to go into all of the lengthy details surrounding all the evidences that support an alternative view of this scripture, but I will put a link down in the description to this article written by Michael Ash in the Sunstone Magazine, November 2006. I gotta tell you, I love this guy, and this is one of the most well-written articles I've ever had the privilege of reading. So check it out. To summarize Ash's article, Corianton's sin was less about sex and more about how his behavior and attitude affected the spiritual well-being of those around him. In fact, all the evidences point to the sin of leading others away from Christ, killing their testimonies, and potentially robbing their souls of eternal life and salvation. Now, if that isn't next to murder, I don't know what is. And even if you don't like this interpretation, I believe it's worth rereading the verse again because you'll find there's a lot more to the chapter than just sexual misconduct. And if you want to challenge me with quotes from presidents of the church who put their foot down on the subject, I'll remind you that members are not obligated to listen to the counsels of prophets when they are not making a statement that is backed by divine dictate, and that I have not yet found a single reference to this subject with divine counsel backing it up. Every statement this humble researcher has been able to find regarding the subject has been referencing Alma 39, a scripture that has been misread for over a hundred years. Why has this misunderstanding gone on for so long, you ask? Well, I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. And finally, number 20. There is no specific prohibition in the Bible against sex between an unmarried man and an unmarried woman. Exposition, exposition, exposition on all the reasons I'm going to hell and why this is inaccurate and why I'm wrong and... Except, I'm not saying it. You are. Or rather, your Christian church organizations are. This is a quote from several Christian church websites. There is also no verses in the Book of Mormon which prohibit the act either, nor in the Buddhist books, nor in the Quran that I've been able to find. Yes, I know there are scriptures that are often referenced. 1 Corinthians comes up a lot, but those verses are not as clear as many of you claim them to be, or want them to be, or wish them to be. Religious leaders have interpreted those verses the way they want them to be interpreted, to support their own beliefs, handed down to them by sexually repressed priests who took their ideas from the philosopher Plato. And the Quran scriptures are just as shady with their translations and reasoning. What we do find in the scriptures is a condemnation of adultery, and sexual immorality. As we've talked about, sexual immorality is not well defined. There are many other terms used which give us some ideas of what might be included in sexual immoral acts, such as being with your father's wife, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians, participating in an orgy, and being consumed with lust and acting in an uncontrolled or selfish sexual manner. Oftentimes, the word fornication is used and its act condemned. But this is another word not well defined, because examples in the scriptures are unclear and contradictory. Today, we define the word to mean unmarried sex, which seems limited to penetrative sex only. What about other kinds? The Greek word in the old manuscripts was translated as fornication no later than 1611 for the King James Version of the Bible. The actual word is porneia? Pornia? I'm not good with languages. It means illicit sexual intercourse and has also been translated as whoredom or simply immorality. So they're guessing as to what the word should be. Illicit means anything forbidden by law, rules, or custom. So fornication in the scriptural context should actually refer to any actions that go against the rules or customs of a people. So 
rape, including spousal rape, is fornication, for example. The point is you don't have to be unwed in order to be guilty of the sin of fornication. And sexual activity by itself is not necessarily against any specific heavenly command. Not my quote, your quote. If your religious group does forbid sex before marriage, then all right. But then you might think to ask why your group forbids sex before marriage in the first place. If they can only reference fornication and immorality scriptures, then they are misrepresenting the scriptures and not providing any actual reason at all. It's a cop-out. Suddenly, those other verses make so much more sense. The weirdly translated statement by Jesus about the fornicating wife and all those verses in Corinthians are no longer so metaphorically burdensome. They're just saying, don't be an idiot when it comes to sex. Although the scriptures never encourage sex except in marriage, the only clear mandate the word gives about sex outside of marriage is to act appropriately. Of course, I'm not encouraging anyone to participate in premarital sex. I would never do that. You see, there are many actual reasons to avoid sexual activity, and they are a lot better than simply, you're going to hell if you do it. Unwanted pregnancies, STDs, emotional scarring, these are real issues and are often better dealt with by emotionally mature individuals, which are really hard to come by. Religion would do well to bear this in mind and consider educating rather than instilling irrational fear and unsupported beliefs in people. And that brings us to the end of our list. I know, it may not be as comprehensive as some of you may have liked. Maybe I missed some issues that you'd like to hear about. List your thoughts in the comments below and I'll see what I can do about keeping this conversation going. But first, let's recap. We have listed pretty much all of the relevant scriptures from the different books of Holy Word. If I missed any, it was not intentional. I did my very best to find all the verses that mattered and researched this subject to the best of my ability. And even if there are some points I've missed, I still think we've done a really great job with what we do have. I don't know of any other source that has put together and discussed this topic to such an extent. Now we need to quickly compare and see what religious values are backed by scripture and what ideas are not. Number one, waiting for marriage to have sex makes sex so much better and more fulfilling. Not scripturally supported. Not supported in any way, shape, or form. Not even supported by medical researchers. Not even supported by anyone with experience. Two, virginity is a biological condition. Not scripturally supported. No, the ideas surrounding virginity were intended to ensure the legitimacy of offspring and inheritance. Three, if you don't get married by a certain age, you're no good not scripturally supported. Remember that Isaac didn't marry till like 40. 4. Sex is meant only for heterosexual cisgender individuals. Not scripturally supported. And the idea is inherently prejudiced and ignorant. 5. Women are here to fulfill a man's needs. Not scripturally supported. The scriptural examples of misogyny were born out of tribal law conditions and not divinely inspired by any faith's deity. Number six, you're damaged goods if you have sex before marriage. Not scripturally supported. A person's value and worthiness is not subject to the condition of their genitals. Number seven, masturbation is a sin. Not scripturally supported. Stop reading into things that aren't there. Number eight, divorce is never okay. Not scripturally supported. Jesus himself gave provision for it. Number nine, menstruation is unclean. Maybe it was at one point and there was probably a hygienic health reason for it, but not an issue anymore. So not scripturally supported. Number 10, adultery is very wrong. Well, yes, adultery is very wrong. And this is one that is supported by scriptures. Although the reasons we hold monogamy as virtuous today are different from the reasons it was originally commanded to be practiced. And the type of monogamy we practice today is a modern invention, the ancients never practiced it. 11. Gay acts are unnatural and cause the destruction of Gomorrah. Not scripturally supported. That's right. While the Bible does have provisions against homosexual activity, it is not a sin to simply be gay, and homosexual acts had little to nothing to do with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. 12. Fellatio was unnatural. Not scripturally supported. Sometimes put into policy by church not to practice such activities with a spouse, there has been no revelations or examples in scriptures to limit the act. 13. Kissing before marriage is like having sex before marriage. 
not scripturally supported. Jesus kissed men. 14. Pornography destroys marriages, not scripturally supported. Ancient ruins of many cultures around the Middle East are full of erotic art and graffiti from their time periods. Porn has always been around and no scripture mentions it. Any and all activities that detract from your relationship can harm your marriage. Pornography is as damaging or no more damaging to a marriage than, say, alcohol abuse or being an ass. If you have a problem with any of those things, get help for your problem. 15. Sex is only meant for procreation, not scripturally supported. Even though some groups discredit the Song of Solomon as not being divinely inspired, there is still no evidence to believe that the only purpose for sex is to populate the earth. 16. Teaching children about sex robs them of their innocence. No. In ancient times, how sex was practiced was important to the covenant family line and passing on of inheritance, so you better believe that they taught their children about sex and were very particular about it. 17. Public school and or church programs are sufficient for kids to learn about sex. Huh. Our education system is far from anything to be boasting about, and you think they're qualified to tell your children anything about the human condition? They aren't even capable of preparing anyone for the actual job market of today's world, let alone educate them on their interpersonal relationships. It's an actual problem in today's society. 18. Sex is always an uncomfortable topic. Shut up. If this is you, you're the problem. 19. Sexual sin is second to murder, not scripturally supported. Number 20. Sex before marriage is a sin. Not scripturally supported. Whoa! All right then. Whew, dang, that felt good. To set the record straight, what is scripturally supported is this. Love your spouse and be devoted. Support each other and your children to the best of your ability. Multiply and replenish the earth. This was the first commandment ever given. Don't be promiscuous. Control your appetites. Bridle your passions. And be respectful to others. Follow the law of your land. Honor the moral code that is common among your people, as long as it is in line with the teachings of God. 6. Don't get carried away. 7. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I know we're all trying to have fun and learn something here, but this one really got to me. It's no wonder hundreds of millions of people are no longer choosing to associate with religious practices and teachings. Religion, you have failed humanity on this subject in every way. The natural consequence is that the world is firing you from being able to hold any opinion, as it should. Now, if you found this useful, please like and subscribe. I'd really like to hear from each of you on what you think on this subject. And don't forget to check out the many links in the description that served as some of my resources putting this together.